Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the government and political correspondent, and we are in the midst of uh, fall election preparations. And so that means interviewing the various candidates. Uh, for this interview, we have uh, from the 10th Senate District, uh, Senator Patty Schockner. Patty, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jamie. I'm excited to be here. Well, Patty, uh, I've interviewed you a couple times. Uh, one, when you were a candidate for uh, the special election that now makes you the incumbent because you were successful. And uh, we also had a brief interview regarding the whole stay-at-home order and the fight between the Supreme Court and uh, uh, the, the legislature and the governor and so forth. Um, Unfortunately, I wish we could say that that pandemic is in the past history, but we're still in the midst of it. So I guess we want to just start with that basic premise. How does a campaign during a pandemic look compared to one that you ran before, which was a special election, got tons of national attention for us for what was just a state uh, regional election, but Nonetheless, uh, how do you see the difference? So that's a really good question. Uh, my special election was, a, you know, right after uh, Thanksgiving, right through the holidays. And then January, we had 40 below zero weather. Uh, there was all kinds of craziness in six weeks. Having an election now, um, being respectful and mindful of uh, other people's uh, opinions on um, the, the pandemic and also being mindful uh, that I still do um, work, uh, do public work in the medical examiner's office. So I am out and about and exposed to many, many people a lot. Um, so my campaign is primarily being uh, run uh, via Zoom and then uh, phone calls and, and it's, it's different, but it's uh, interesting. I made over a hundred phone calls today talking to constituents and actually, um, it seems like uh, more and more people are willing to engage in a more honest conversation when it's one-on-one. -on -one. So I kind of like it. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting when you have that one-on-one -on -one time uh, with folks and uh, it's um, everything from, uh, you know, yes, these are the big issues that are concerning them because that's really important to me, uh, whether it's COVID, the environment, healthcare, uh, but also just, you know, the, the personal impacts of uh, what we do, uh, how does it impact them? And uh, we, you know, and when I call constituents, I'm calling people on both sides. And uh, it's really interesting. I've been hung up on a few, few times, but for the most part, people want to talk and really discuss. And um, what I'm finding is that we all want the same thing. We all want to live in a safe and secure uh, community and, you know, be able to exercise our constitutional rights and also, you know, feel safe doing it. So I, I think campaigning uh, uh, in the 21st century is, is looking a little different. Um, I think there will be, after the pandemic is done, you know, there will be going back to some other things, but people are People are really appreciative. Uh, I think the pandemic has given us all the opportunity to look at our time a little differently. And, uh, you know, having a five minute phone call uh, can be uh, very rewarding, especially if it's one on one with your legislator. So I really like uh, doing that. So before I start talking about your uh, time as our state senator uh, since that special election, uh, let's just refresh the folks as far as your background before you ran for office. Um, what, what, you know, what's been your life experience and uh, your work experience? So my life experience really has been in healthcare, uh, starting back in the late seventies uh, as a, a nurse's assistant. Um, in the eighties, uh, I went to EMT school, got my EMT license, my EMTI, uh, uh, began teaching at WITC and, and continued to work uh, in EMS, was the um, director of the Stir Prairie First Responders. So, you know, I've seen the 
uh, what happens when people don't have access to health care. I've seen it for decades. Um, and then in between there, I worked at the Chamber of Commerce in Stillwater. I was the executive director, so I understand the business part of, of things. Uh, I was hired as a death investigator back in 2003 with St. Croix County, promoted to chief medical examiner, which is a position I still hold uh, today, uh, doing uh, death investigations. So um, again, I have uh, bear witness to uh, what happens uh, with untreated mental illness and addiction uh, issues and mental health and also, uh, you know, um, just regular diagnoses from uh, untreated cancers to diabetes to hypertension. So I've been working in this, in this field for a long time and uh, um, have seen a lot of folks in my uh, tenure of doing that for almost three decades. So... Um... So based on that exposure to healthcare, I'm just going to take a wild guess. Is that one of your top three issues in this campaign? Yes, it is. Healthcare is really uh, the top issue that I have always been fighting for. And really, um, there's a lot more work to do. I'm glad that uh, my uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle have jumped on to uh, the mental health conversation because uh, clearly it has been ignored for decades. Um, again, as someone who has worked in it for decades, um, I, I have seen what happens when you don't ca take care of people with mental illness. And, uh, you know, this goes back a long ways. And we have um, from, you know, healthcare changed and, and you really can really see a lot of it. When I was first working in EMS um, is when healthcare was starting to change. And that's when people would call an ambulance if they didn't have insurance because they were guaranteed care. And, you know, um, you had to pick them up, you had to treat them, you had to bring them to the emergency room, whether or not they had or did not have uh, medical insurance, and they had to be treated. And we saw that in not only medical emergencies, but then also mental health emergencies. Through uh, the years that there um, has continued to be an issue, which is why uh, taking and, and really acknowledging, expanding the um, Medicaid expansion would have been so helpful to Wisconsinites that it would have got uh, over 150,000 people insurance that didn't have it. And it would have opened up doors of other revenues for us to bring to the state of Wisconsin that would have helped us with topics like mental health and uh, addiction. Um, you know, a lot of the problems, we are so close to the Twin Cities, but if you're on, on Badger Care, um, you can't utilize a lot of the uh, options that are right across the bridge. So for someone who is uh, struggling with transportation, whether you go 20 miles to St. Paul or 80 miles to Eau Claire or somewhere else, it can be a real problem and a real challenge. So for people in the 10th district, having access to healthcare is, is critical and having access to local healthcare is uh, imperative to the health and well-being of our whole uh, district. Okay. Well, and you mentioned about mental health and um, the, your opponent, um, when he was interviewed on the show, did mention um, your vote and the governor's veto of bringing a facility to Eau Claire. And I wanted to give you opportunity to explain that a little bit. Certainly. There's background to that issue. Yes, certainly. The chapter 20, the chapter 51, uh, uh, legislation really has to do, or statute has to do with people who are in a mental health crisis are deemed a danger to themselves or someone else and will have an emergency detention. So right now, if uh, you are a chapter 51, you will be evaluated at the local hospital and you will be, um, once you are deemed clear, you then are handcuffed, put in the back of the car and then transported to the other side of the state to Mendota um, or uh, one of the other state facilities. What that legislation was, was to do a $15 million earmark to a local hospital that is failing in Eau Claire with no accountability. Just give them the 15 million, let them retrofit the hospital to a mental health hospital with no, um, nothing to guarantee that it would stay that way or who it would serve or how it would help. Because you can't, we don't transport people from this area every day to Mendota, but that hospital would have to have patients there every day. 
So to think that there, it's going to have, it's going to change the problem. The problem is the numbers of people with mental health and the people, the mental health services that we need locally. So if you think about that person who is in crisis, and um, the first thing the doctors do is try to to find a local bed, which are nearly impossible, and then they have to go where the opening is. So to think that building a $15 million, you know, upgrade to this hospital will solve the problem, it will not. But what would have solved the problem would have been uh, a, a bill that we had out there for telepsych, which is unique to the Western Wisconsin, to our host hospitals here. Um, I wrote uh, legislation on that and uh, my uh, opponent wouldn't even sign on that. And that was for $150,000. And the telepsych program is very effective um, and is something unique here that we could have and had an opportunity to, to build it throughout uh, not only District 10, but the state in uh, a way that you do uh, mental health treatment that is uh, using broadband, it uh, utilizes local uh, resources, and you're able to help people with their plan um, to, to get safety and get the resources that they need locally so they don't have to be transported. It actually helps lower the numbers. So that would have been a collaborative fix uh, that we could have had locally that would have benefited us locally, and my opponent did not sign on to that. Uh, I don't understand. How is that not a bipartisan issue? It was a bipartisan issue when it was brought the first time around. Um, who My uh, predecessor, Sheila Harsdorf, is the one that started that program, but it was aging out. So we needed to have an update, and uh, my colleagues on the other side would not do it. So, um, and that was a $150,000 fix that would have stayed right here in District 10. Okay. Um, now, so you mentioned uh, mental health, and you mentioned District 10. I'm jumping around a little bit, forgive me, but uh, I guess um, when you're not the challenger and you're an incumbent, you say so you have a record and so forth. The, the district that you refer to, 10th Senate District, can you provide our viewers with what, what's the geography of that? It's the so, 28th, 29th, and 30th Assembly Districts, but where are those? Okay, so it runs um, uh, from Menominee, the city of Menominee uh, in Dunn County, and it includes Boysville, and then wraps around into Pierce County, and then comes into most of St. Croix County, most of Polk County, and then up to uh, a little bit north of Webster. Um, so so it's, Burnett uh, County. In Burnett County, yes. So it's pretty broad, and it's it's very diverse. You know, when you think about it, Burnett County really is one of the one of the uh, counties that really has the least amount of population uh, and uh, the most sparsely populated uh, area uh, in the state. However, they have some of the most expensive real estate uh, with the lake homes and, and that. So um, when it comes to the people who actually live in, in Burnett County, they are tax rich, but income poor. Um, so it makes it really uh, interesting when you're, you're looking at school districts like the Webster School District or the Grantsburg School District and the disparities that they have in those areas. So um, it, it, it's very interesting. Um, and then, you know, when you go into Polk County, you're starting to get a little more with uh, Osceola, St. Croix Falls, Amory, a little more um, closer to the Twin Cities. So you still have that poverty, but their uh, ratio and population is a little higher. St. Croix County, of course, is far more uh, diverse. And then the city of River Falls and uh, moving into Menominee, you know, we primarily have the two uh, large communities that have universities right in them. So it's a very broad, hundred and almost 180,000 people that uh, I represent. Uh, 19 school districts. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and, you know, going from uh, the Hudson School District, which is the largest, and, and then taking, for example, the Boysville School District. Uh, the Boysville school, school District has one of the top science Olympiad uh, teams in the nation. And every year um, before COVID, they would have a national competition where people, uh, teams would fly in from the throughout the United States to compete in Boysville. Uh, 
and the Science Olympiad. So that's really, really uh, interesting to think that little, that little community has uh, that kind of uh, program, uh, but they do. And uh, Boysville is one of those school districts that um, they have 95% of their students go on to college. So, and most of their students that go on to college, last, last year they had five that uh, had um, Ivy League scholarships. So it's really interesting in a, in a small district like this and in, uh, in an area that has a community that is so rural that they have that uh, kind of opportunities for kids. So it's, it's, it's really fun to, uh, for me to have gotten to know what's going on in each district. And one of the other things, um, you've got experience on Board of Education, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I served on the Somerset Board of Education, and then I'm on the, the K-12 uh, Education Committee, and then also college and technical schools. Um, you know, when you, when you look at how are we going to, uh, you know, through legislation, create, you know, you know, opportunities for all students in all places where they're at, um, it really is looking at the, the whole picture of what we have to do, uh, offer uh, uh, students here, and that's all kinds of students uh, in, in educational opportunities, whether it's in the, the um, early reading programs, to the articulation programs with the technical schools in the high schools, to uh, the certification and credentials that we can work with in our industrial parks and the technical schools, all the way to our colleges and you know, some of our folks moving uh, after they get, go through their technical and skills development that hopefully they have an employer that's willing to invest in their uh, continued lifelong learning and help them with uh, more degrees as they move forward. So um, education is essential um, and not investing in education uh, and looking at in education as a tax liability versus a economic development tool is um, where I come from. I really believe that education is an investment at every level for local eco economic development and not a tax liability. Okay. And I think I've stumbled upon uh, issue number two for you, right? I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> you're talking about your priorities. You mentioned healthcare, yeah. a long history yeah. going back to the 70s, and then uh, a pretty good interest and, and position still uh, whether it's K-12 or post-education. And one of those, it's one of those areas where um, the partisan fight has gotten to pit those two against each other and where the prior governor would make investments. Um, it happened every four years when he was running for re-election. You'd see a big influx of money, but then the, um, uh, you know, it would be sometimes pitted against the post high school education system and so that there were winners and losers. And where do you fall on that? Do you see it as a zero sum game? If we invest in one, we have to take from the other? Uh, no, I, I think we have to invest in uh, all education. And when you think about it, um, if you are starting out, you know, you've worked your way through high school, you've decided that let's say you wanna go uh, into the HVAC field. So, you know, you, you, you get a really good technical edu uh, education in school through uh, the different uh, classes that are op offered. You maybe even had a opportunity to uh, be an intern or, you know, work in, our, uh, in a mentorship program in your local uh, uh, industrial park. And now you've decided, well, okay, I'm gonna go to school, I'm gonna get some credentials, I'm gonna go to technical school. Um, to think that you're going to go to technical school and never have to go back to update your skills is, is ridiculous. Um, you know, just look at your basic HVAC systems. They're changing so much. And when you, you look at the top of school districts and large buildings and hospitals, and I mean, HVAC is a technical uh, uh, field now um, and you have to have good computer skills you have to good technical reading skills and you have to update all the time because as products become more and more um, updated you have to have the education to back back it up um, and the credentials because no one is going to let you experiment on a million dollar piece of equipment they want to know that you have the basic skills so once you've got that those their skills then working into an advanced degree is only going to help you become more successful down the road so i think um nowadays uh 
you know, working through your educational process and not thinking that that uh, diploma is the end game, it is the start game. You know, the, your high school diploma is the start of your choice on where you're gonna go. Your technical diploma and cur uh, credentials is the start for the next step. And then you move on to, you know, bachelor's degrees, uh, master's degrees, and even doctorates. And the world is your oyster now. And if you uh, think that you're just going to um, have one uh, class and that's going to take you through for the rest of your career, um, you're not thinking about being a 21st century uh, employee. You're not thinking about being a 21st century employer. And you're certainly not thinking about being a 21st century citizen. All right. So how long have you been in the Senate? Two years. Two right. years. It's been pretty uh, fast paced. And in those two years, uh, that was uh, slightly before the gubernatorial election. Is that right? That yeah. special election? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then January. you saw, obviously, the change in governor. But um, you've been in the minority under both a Republican governor and a Democratic governor. Have you seen any difference? And uh, what are your frustrations being in the minority? So, um, you know, I think uh, when you uh, go into somewhere into a, a new uh, opportunity, which, uh, you know, this was a huge opportunity for me um, to go into legislature, I just assumed after sitting on a town board uh, for two terms and a school board for uh, a term and working under county government for, you know, over a decade, that everybody worked together because they're all nonpartisan uh, elected positions. So I kind of went to this here with that type of uh, uh, a feeling that we were all gonna work together and this was gonna be awesome. And um, you know, that's not how it works. Uh, when you write a bill, uh, like I wrote uh, the legislation, I had a bill for uh, a tax uh, credit for gun safes. So you would think that would be an, an easy sell that, uh, you know, your, your counterparts in your assembly district would, be, you know, uh, support it. Um, I, the only bill I have had that has been supported by any of the uh, uh, counterparts in uh, the assembly districts was uh, the disability rights uh, voting bill that Shannon Zimmerman signed with me. Otherwise, uh, that hasn't happened. Although I have signed on some of their bills, they have not signed on mine. So I learned pretty quickly that um, this conversation about all the bipartisan work, 95% um, of the bills that we write, uh, that we are voting on, really are technical changes and not policy. So, you know, it might be an updating of a word. It might be, you know, those type of things. Uh, about 5% of our policy uh, that is the most meaningful is the one that goes right down uh, party lines. And it's very interesting, you know, when you take on uh, topics that you know the governor will veto, so that's the ones you push through. And, you know, and because it is my colleagues on the other side that guide the calendar and guide what makes, what gets on the, the floor. It's not the minority party, it's the majority party. So they guide the conversation. So there is a lot of strategery that goes on there. Um, and if you don't want the governor to be successful, then you would only schedule, you know, less than 10 days of work in a year, which is what has happened uh, both t uh, years that, that I've been in session. I mean, it, we very rarely meet. Um, and, you know, uh, we, I do have had the opportunity to do tons of local constituent work, which is great. And our office has a, a wonderful constituent outreach uh, program that is set up. We have helped tens of, you know, uh, thousands of calls. But to do actual policy work, um, that has been very difficult and very partisan. Um, even though I uh, voted my first vote as uh, the senator was against my party, and it was the, the shooting range bill. And I also uh, voted with the, the GOP on the nurses aid bill. So um, I can honestly say I have reached across and I have done what's right for uh, District uh, 10 and making sure that uh, the, the members of the district were served first before party. 
and uh, I'm pretty proud of that. That's uh, that is me. I it's that's how I operate. And all the while I've been doing it, I've always been focusing on the uh, healthcare, education, and the environment. To me, if we want to have uh, really uh, good citizens citizenry, we have to have healthcare. We have to have education, and we have to have clean water. Um, we are very lucky to live in this area where we have the St. Croix River, the Apple River, the Kinnick, the Rush. Uh, we have beautiful lakes, more than most people could even dream of. And uh, keeping our natural resources is really uh, a basic piece of mental health, which is huge for the healthcare piece. And it's also part of education, learning where we live and what we have and how water flows and what our water table is like. I mean, it all flows together. And that's why I focus on, on those three the most. Okay, healthcare, education, the environment. And you mentioned about uh, being proud of reaching across the aisle. At some point though, when you're reaching across, extending that hand uh, and it's not being reciprocated, um, don't you ever feel like it? you wanna just pull it back and say, that's gonna be the game you're gonna play? Um, I guess that's just not my style. <laughs> you know, I know there are a lot of people that play that game. That's just not my style. Um, I have worked 30 years uh, going into people's homes uh, that have reached out for help, whether it's in emergency services or in a real time of dire need in the medical examiner's office. And I've never once asked anybody how they voted. And so I think that every conversation is an opportunity for a new conversation. Um, and I'm pretty persistent. And I guess um, with doing all the work that I have uh, within the community and seeing uh, people at their best and at their worst, I'm always optimistic that at the end of the day, uh, we will get there. I don't know how that route looks, but we will get there. And uh, I'm just doing um, my part to make sure that I'm representing uh, the folks of uh, District 10. And that means everybody, whether they voted for me or not. Um, the day that you only represent the people that voted for you is kind of why we're in this very polarized world right now. You know, all, all community, all constituents of, you know, the United States, all of us should, be, should feel like our representatives represent me. The day that I feel that my representative doesn't represent me is the day that democracy is broken. So I, I really work hard to make sure that no matter if you voted for me or not, that um, my job is to make sure that you get the services or the answers that you want. I can't guarantee you that you're going to like the answers, but I will always make sure that you get the answers to your questions. All right. Now, you talked about your big three, healthcare, education, and the environment. And there's a couple, uh, not on that list, um, that just happen to be in the news, uh, either on the state level or the national level, and that is peace and justice issues. Um, and so um, what do you see some of the impacts, whether it's the events in Kenosha, um, what do you think the impact is going to be uh, after the election and the Senate reconvenes down in Madison? Well, I, you know, um, I, I think that everything that go, is going on right now, whether it's in our state or the nation, is a wake up call for all of us to at least acknowledge that there's an issue. Um, you know, after the election, uh, hopefully it will be a healing time where we can, you know, come together. We know after the state election, there will be some sort of budget repair bill at the state level. Um, hopefully it is not going to be a budget repair bill that goes after education or health care. But, you know, um, education seems to be the, the, the one that gets uh, cut the most. So... Um, when you think about that, uh, you know, cutting education, uh, especially for young parents nowadays, is, you know, when they're looking at what, what, we, what we're going to do for our kids, um, there are yet less kids now than there were uh, ten, 10 years ago. And we have to do whatever we can if we're really truly uh, thinking about economic drivers, we need to make sure that we look at the kids as uh, investments in the future. 
we're, you know, in public education, you're going to educate a student for 13 years or more, depending where they enter in and head start and all that. Why would we want not want to make sure that we get a really, really well-rounded student who is ready to succeed, go get their secondary education, bring it back to our community? If all the young people keep leaving, um, we're just going to have a uh, state that just uh, does not, is not going to be able to fill the gap with our older people. I'm 60 years old. You know, I, I look at this stuff and I talk to my kids and my grandkids and, you know, my oldest grandson is graduating from high school in his perspective of, you know, what he wants and where he wants to live is very different than mine. And I want him to feel that wherever he lives, that he has the confidence that, you know, he has a good education and that that community is going to be a supportive community. And uh, we need to really uh, actually start bringing uh, young students to the table and, and hear what they have to say about what they think about the communities. Um, you know, it's, it's real easy to say that kids are doing everything wrong when uh, they're not. And they're just 21st century kids. They're doing things different than we were. You know, um, you, you can't apply for a job if you don't have a smartphone. It's as simple as that. Um, you're, you can't. So we have to make sure that all our students have that 21st century application and that we as a community and legislators make sure that all those opportunities are here. COVID was a prime example of showing where the cracks in our system were, especially when it comes to broadband. And as we have more and more people working remotely, and we were able to see in every school district that there are holes in broadband and there are holes in technology. So if I was a young person who was innovative and wanted to have a technology-based business, would I put my business that, in a place that didn't have access to good well, internet? Right. And this is, um, it sounds 21st century and everything, but uh, internet's been around for 25 years um, and but yet and the legislature has had one party in in control why isn't more being done on broadband you, you're not the first candidate to bring this up why do we have these cracks in the armor as you put them the, it was we privatized we privatized it so then a lot of the telcos I mean we started having islands all over and and that's the problem and you know, um, I talked to someone from Glenwood City that they have access, but just to get that final mile is $2,500 to go from the road to their, to their house. So we have all these places that they don't have it because of how our system was set up. If we want 21st century, you know, and there's going to be a lot of grants and programs out there available to help grow our internet system, but we have to be willing to invest in it. And if we're not going to invest in the, the actual process legislation of building out our systems, which is not going to be thousands of dollars, it's going to be millions and millions and millions of dollars, and we need to be realistic about it, um, it's not going to happen. So, and we need it for our schools, we need it for healthcare. Um, you know, how many people are going to the doctor now and, and doing their, their appointments uh, through telehealth? If you don't have access and if you don't have access to the internet, you are going to be restricted from your access to healthcare. Okay. And well, I, I, I've got to stop us there because we're over time. Uh, <laughs> we could probably go for another half hour. Uh, I know. Patty. But uh, thank you for um, uh, coming on the show again. And um, good luck with the last, uh, what, you got eight and a half weeks to yeah. uh, election. So Yeah, we're almost there. Yep. Uh, very good. And, and I want to thank our viewers for watching another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. Stay informed. And oh, I should give you that opportunity. How do they uh, learn more about you and um, what you're doing? You can visit my uh, website at pattyforsenate.com or Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, yeah, we're it's not all on Patty for Senate. Patty for Senate with a Y. Mm hmm. Okay, Patty with, with a Y. Very good. Thanks, Patty, for that Thanks. reminder. And again, um, thank you for watching Western Wisconsin Journal. Keep watching. Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the government and political correspondent. And we are in the midst of uh, fall election preparations. And so that means interviewing the various candidates. Uh, for this interview, we have 
uh, from the 10th Senate District, uh, Senator Patty Schachner. Patty, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jamie. I'm excited to be here. Well, Patty, uh, I've interviewed you a couple times. Uh, one, when you were a candidate for uh, the special election that now makes you the incumbent because you were successful. And uh, we also had a brief interview regarding the whole stay-at-home order and the fight between the Supreme Court and uh, uh, the, the legislature and the governor and so forth. Um, unfortunately, I wish we could say that that pandemic is in the past history, but we're still in the midst of it. So I guess we wanna just start with that basic premise. How does a campaign 